No worries. Um, OK, so I'm just going to do some very, very quick thank yous. Thank you so let, much. Let's as, just as... scoot down so we can see oh, everyone. Yeah. Great. Good plan. I, I have the most melanin, so I, I will sit the most <laughs> in the sun. OK. <laughs> yeah. Hang on, I'll just tuck myself in. There we go. Um, so uh, we are amongst an amazing group of friends here, and I think one of the things that struck me about Rare, why I wanted to get involved with Rare in the first place, is this amazing spirit of collaboration and about really sort of understanding and helping each other through through difference and through intersectionality. They have been incredibly supportive to us. So she says is a global volunteer network to get more women into the creative industries. We've been going for 12 years. And we were actually also recipients of one of the first grants that they gave, which has enabled us to build our mentoring program. So that, a huge, huge thank you to Rare. I'm going to introduce these incredible women on my panel. I kind of feel like in the spirit of rare and everything that's happened this week, that you're all my super wonderful friends. So it's a you know it's been a, a, a great experience. I couldn't have also done this on my own. So um, we have a partner here as well. So Open Topics. And the idea of Open Topics. The idea of Open Topics is to pose one like killer question that we can really get into. And I also wanted to thank their image partner, Stoxy, uh, which is an amazing um, sort of image library of incredibly diverse uh, pictures that we can all use to make our advertising better. So thank you to all these amazing people, and particularly also to Jenny and Mia, who have basically made this happen, and to Lucille. So our question that I want to post to the panel is, is outside the new inn? Who wants to go first and introduce yourself? Oh, sure. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Blair Amani. I'm an activist, author, and historian. Um, my first book is called Modern History, and my second book is called Making Our Way Home, which comes out in 2020. I'm sure I'll be pestering everyone to purchase it once it's available. I think that out is certainly the new in. I've grown up my entire life feeling like an outsider, and I've just taken to embracing it now, which I think is a really beautiful place to be. I think that our experience uh, on planet Earth is to come into our full selves, and I'm privileged and blessed to be able to do that every single day. It's not the case for everyone which is how we know that there's still work to be done. I think certainly, especially coming from the States with Donald Trump being in office, I've had many people, I think in a well-meaning way, tell me I wouldn't have a career if Donald Trump wasn't president, which is like, yes, I would, because uh, I was working before he was. But anyway, um, but people say that in that well-meaning way, I think to emphasize it, for better or for worse, that diversity and inclusion are very hot and interesting topics now to various companies. We all remember that Pepsi commercial where they're trying to kind of co-op everyone's face. <laughs> Everyone was like, oh, yes. Um, we're trying to co-op the Black Lives Matter movement. But, you know, even though that went horribly wrong and was completely inauthentic, I think it still shows that a fringe movement, as it was called, Black Lives Matter folks, as such as myself, being called extremists, we're now so appealing and so marketable that people are trying to use the movement to sell soft drinks to middle America. And so I think that um, right now the conversation is about how, to, how companies can get it right. And that's some of the work that I do, speaking with different organizations. But I definitely think out is the new in, but we have, we're not not quite there yet. Yeah. Yeah. And T, what about your experience? Because obviously you also come from this incredible innovation background. And I'd love to know okay. how that connects. Really? Yeah. Can I just riff on what Blair was saying? Because that's much easier. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> My name's T. I run a very small part of Google's Creative Lab in Sydney in Australia. We work at the intersection of technology and I tend to work with culture, looking at how humans kind of respond to information in space and time, which is fun. I'm trans and queer, and I have mental health issues and <laughs> neurodiversity issues, or whatever we're going to call them. Like, I, I um, have gone from the position of being very much your standard white, cis, hetero, male creative director with stubble <laughs> to what you see. So I have opinions. <laughs> <laughs> the panel the panel we did the other day on the terrace, on Lizzie's terrace stage, by the way, um, <laughs> um, was remarkable because you had to note that the, that the, the panned idea of inclusion is still outside the building. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's quite hard to be on the inside if we're actually on the outside. Yes. And like, you know, is, is, uh, what, is it outside the new inn? Yeah, well, we've got a really difficult problem with that as well. We've got wonderful things like the picture library, uh, which is Stocksy, and then you know that that's going to get slightly abused yeah. because those voices, those images will be seen and those voices will not be heard. 
So, like, I'd love to hear from Stoxy, uh, uh, like, that, that you're not allowed to use those images unless you're going to actually represent the voices that are indicated and not appropriate. Um, and then the other major issue I have is this kind of slight issue we have with um, fashion. We have had people on that stage being asked whether trans was a, a trend. Yeah, I know. Like, but literally, like, in a live question and answer, Lizzie had to ask it because it was the most voted for question. Um, that's a problem, right? So if, if out is the new, or if out is the new in, then we've got to ask whether queer is the new in, whether black is the new black. <laughs> like, what are we, what are we, what is this question you're asking? Are you saying that we are now at a place where we can seriously feel that we belong? Because we are here in a way that we haven't been for many years, and that is fantastic. But we are generally here as speakers, as staff, as organizers, we are a true fringe as opposed to that fringe <laughs> down on the beach. So, no, <laughs> we're being used at the moment, but we need to take that position and flip it into a place where they can't get us out. Yeah. That's what I think. I'm Megan Kelly. I own a production company based in New York and LA called Honor Society. I'm also the co-founder of an organization called Owned, which is to celebrate and promote uh, female business owners, because we are quite a minority, especially within this business itself. Um, sort of add on to what you guys were saying that, of course, uh, absurd statement that you wouldn't have a career if Donald Trump wasn't president as a fellow American. Um, you know, I, I think that what that person was probably trying to say is, I, I, I keep saying that there was a moment if Hillary had won where I think we kind of all would have like patted ourselves on the back like, yeah, we did it. We broke the glass ceiling. It was awesome. Uh, which, of course, we hadn't. And I think that everything that's happened for us there, and I'm obviously there's a, a lot of right-moving things happening globally that are pushing the conversation forward. Because I think that we've all started to say, you know what? No, I'm not going to be grabbed by the P, and I'm not going to be put in the back and I'm not going to be pushed against a border wall and I'm not going to be um, taking my rights away that have been given forward. And we had this moment where the pendulum has started to move forward socially and now they're trying to pull it back. And it's really important for us to keep for fighting for it and, and having these conversations. And I, I was really heartened by so many of the conversations I've heard this week here. And then I've had people be like, I can't believe we're still talking about this in 2019. Like, are we <laughs> over this? And, and it's like, yes, to some degree, I understand what you're saying. It, it, it is like, wow, are we really, like, we're still not treating each other equally, but we're not, and the action hasn't come. And so we all really need to get that action going. We need to take these conversations, and we need to say, what can I do? What am I in the position to do to help make these things actually happen and have these conversations be more than just hyperbole? Just quickly before we move on to uh, Kizuro, uh, uh, to, to build on that, there is an awful amount of research that has come out recently around the fact that when you as a society do move forward in a positive way, it almost gives people then like the excuse to go back the other way. They've got, I've done one great thing, as you said, the pat on the back, and that means I don't have to do any other great thing. So I think even though this feels like every conversation you have is, uh, you know, and everything written in the trade press in the UK, there are people coming out going, God, diversity is so boring. We're so sick of talking about it, but it's only now when we've pushed so hard, I feel, that we have to keep pushing. Hi, my name is Kazuha Okuda. I'm from Google. I work, I'm based in Tokyo, Japan, and I'm now working together with Steph and Tara to bring Red to Tokyo for the first time. I'm super, super excited. And the reason why I'm so excited and so committed is that, you know, I was actually getting Tara and Steph prepared for what they're facing, what well, they'll be facing, because you know, I was just explaining. Imagine Sydney, London, 50 years back. That's where we are in Japan. It's like, you know, if you, I'm, every meeting I have with agency or people, like media people, I'm sitting in front of the people, like 20 men in suit, black suit, and me on this other side. And, you know, if I have met women attending the meeting, they're always sitting in the back row, speak, not speaking a word. So I guess the reason why I'm so excited is to bring Rare to Tokyo is that I want to make a change in this situation. Even a small, it could be a small step, but I, th I think this is really, really needed in the situation that we are seeing right now. 
and that question about um, out in out inside. To me, I guess is it really outside inside? I guess it's the human, the same human being. I guess I don't want us to draw the line. You know, the, the whole point is making everything inclusive. So what's the point of drawing line in between? I don't want us to be divided. The whole point is getting. You know, if you zoom out. Like far out, like, you know, far from the above, it's the same thing. So what's the point of it being like, kind of defining what's out, what's in? Yeah. So my, maybe my answer is probably no, because it should be, it shouldn't be the outsider, insider who gets to be in and who gets to, who has to be out. I don't think that's a discussion we want to have. Yeah. And I think, oh yeah. 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 Um, going off the other point you were mentioning and what Teed said and really what everyone said, it really makes me think about the ways that we are used. Um, and I, so for example, pink washing has been a huge conversation, rainbow washing, however you like to call it, where companies suddenly decide they care so much about gay people that even though they won't hire any, they, uh, or you know, rent to any, or open accounts for any, um, or help people change their names uh, when they're on a plane, for example, um, they want to sell to us. Um, so our money matters, but we still don't. And so I had a very um, annoying situation where I did a campaign with New York City Pride, um, and basically it was told to us that it was for the community. And I'm like, okay, community, that means, you know, I'm expecting a certain level of, um, I guess, marketing. I'm not expecting to be on billboards all over the world and be on bus ads um, like a model that should have gotten paid. Um, and so, yeah. So it kind. You mean that you you mean that that campaign was was that that unpaid? No way. Until I raised a bunch of hell on Twitter, and now everyone's getting a check. Um, Yay! <laughs> yeah, which is great. It's the <laughs> ideal situation. But I think that a lot, oftentimes companies try to push as far as they can on the premise that you're getting um, visibility. But for me, you know, being someone who's of historically marginalized identities, I'm black, I'm queer, I'm Muslim, being in a pride ad in a hijab, I'm one, being tokenized, um, but then two, my voice isn't being heard and I'm getting backlash from everyone, like from all sides, from people in the queer community who are Islamophobic, from Muslim people who are homophobic, from people who don't like green eyeliner, just everyone. <laughs> and so um, visibility is not always a gift, and especially when it's not on your own terms. So I made this very long thread on Twitter, which I'll resurface so you all can see if you follow me on at Blair Imani, um, where I was just talking about how it felt so ingenuine that you're you know, claiming to represent the queer community, and yet we can't go to the opening ceremony of Pride because that wasn't part of the deal, and yet we're being used to market Pride. Um, I'm very against corporate Pride, and so actually I will be speaking at the uh, Reclaiming Pride March, which is going to use the original route of Pride and really taking it back. Um, but I think it's also very powerful that even though there was an attempt to use me and my image for a corporate Pride, I'm still very committed to speaking against that. Um, so it just it reminds me that you can't just be kind of passive in the space. You have to be an activist. You have to take action and be aware and speak up um, because sometimes it ends up getting everyone else paid as well, but it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd like for my... <laughs> for my... my personal experience, I think, um, working a lot with Stonewall and being very heavily involved in Pride in the UK, um, it is still an appalling situation where brands care for a day or for a week, um, or actually people in the general public care for a day or a week and go, brilliant, we support LGBT people, for example, and then do nothing about it for Are the other. Are we going to talk about Monroe? Are we going to talk about I what just Monroe. happened to Monroe? Do you want to talk about what's happened? Yeah, okay. Does everybody know what just happened to Monroe Bergdorf? Hand show, because I know no one likes saying anything. No, no one knows. Great. So Manuel Bergdorf is an activist, a model, um, and a fantastic um, example, really, of, of um, trans, trans women. She has struggled in the UK because she is outspoken on issues of race. She is outspoken on issues of gender. She stands up for her community. Um, it's one thing to be kind of ditched as the face of L'Oreal because you made some stupid comments on... on mm. Facebook. This is a couple of years ago. It's another thing to announce because the NSPCC, the National Society for Protection yeah. of Qu uh, Cruelty Against Children, have appointed you an ambassador, their first LGBTQ ambassador, and then to have British journalists start a smear campaign saying that she's a porn model on Twitter. And within two days, yeah. she's cut. Yeah. And they didn't talk to her. They just cut her. Yeah. And then, 
And can I also say as well, just, Monroe's a dear friend of mine, and yeah. she had just launched, uh, she's working on launching a crowdfunding platform for trans women. So everything she does, whether it's in the public eye, it's always going back to the community. And I think that's the most powerful thing we can all keep in mind as we do our work, is that if you can't bring your community with you, why are you doing the work? If you're entering the space and you're the only one like you, you're not serving a very good purpose because you should be opening and breaking down doors. Yep. So that's constantly what Monroe's doing. And so uh, in the middle of all this, again, there's a smear campaign which puts everything on halt for her she has to do damage control, but then also just seeing how um, trans and LGBTQ youth who are part of that program are now also feeling marginalized. Oh, we can't be a part of anything because if we do anything, we're going to come under negative scrutiny. And it makes it very, very hard for anyone in that community to realistically work with this mm -hmm. society, which is the biggest society for the protection of, against cruelty to children in the UK. They still have their rainbow flag on Twitter. Mm. Yeah, oh... We're it's some bullshit. It's some bullshit. Oh, I'm sorry. Google. It's some <laughs> hogwash. It is hogwash. And um, I, you see it time and time again where you have a company with a scandal where, you know, they're not hiring trans employees or they're placing these barriers and yet they'll still have a rainbow wash flag. Um, and it, it's just shirking the responsibilities. Yeah. Um, the last thing I'll say, because I want to give everyone else space, is... Um, Realizing my role as like a public figure and an influencer, what I've taken to doing is creating this correct, like this um, rubric uh, for rec requirements to participate in brand activations. So yeah, you're going to have a rainbow like logo, but you're also going to donate all of your profits, mm -hmm. fossil for example, uh -huh. to LGBTQ organizations, and then I'll be the face of it. But I have to make sure that it's going back to my community. I'm doing yep. the same thing with Tom's, where um, I'm their brand ambassador for Pride, but also making sure. Keep going, keep going. They're giving money to <laughs> LGBTQ causes and, and Muslim causes and black causes because uh, if you want all of me, you're going to support yep. all of my communities. And so I think that it's, it's calling on ourselves to do that, not only because it looks good and it makes great press, it makes great write-off to do corporate social responsibility, but because it's literally the right thing to do. If you're getting paid and there's still people hungry who live in your community, there's more work that needs yeah. to be done. It sucks so much to have to call out a charity. Yeah, yeah. You know what that feels like? To yeah. call out a children's charity? Yeah. This is not where we want to be. No. Um, can I ask you, Megan, um, I guess, you know, we are amongst, like, friends here, right? We are all kind of fighting for the same set of equality and inclusion. Yeah. Um, but what can, we, what can we do as people here who have, a, a, like, a relative understanding of it, and we have, have all the genuine ambition and like, positivity in the world, but what, what can we do to harness this little bit of energy here and really make a difference? I mean, I, I think, you know, just listening to these stories, um, it, the only thing that comes into my mind is how much time we spend hating on each other and hating different initiatives and, oh, well, they're starting that and they're doing that and no way I gotta talk about that now. And it's like, if you just stopped and said, oh, that's great, they're doing something positive, I'm gonna do something positive. And to be for something rather than to be against something, I think if we could just take that moment and, and, and even check ourselves because I think we all do it. We all kind of look at the glass half empty like, oh, well, whatever. You know, instead of that, say, what can I do here? How can I be positive? How can I support that um, and and I think we all have to look at ourselves and, and sort of you know for people like me I'm, I'm a white woman yes I have the woman thing going against me or, or for me however you want to look at it um, but you know how how can I spend my privilege you know and being a company owner how can I make those changes you know how can I make my company more equal how can I make my company more diverse how can I encourage other people to do that how can I encourage other women to own and and how to make their companies more diverse and how can we put pressure or encourage corporate America or corporate world to um, to in make diversity more than just a talking point. And, and we really have to start to have those conversations. And I think that we also have to stop having it in a way that's acrimonious and you're accusing people of you're a sexist, you're a racist. It's, you know, let's start talking about it. Let's find our way in on, on empathy. We all have had times where we have not felt like we've belonged or we've been discriminated against in some way which can make me have empathy for the way that you've not belonged. And you've, I might not be able to really truly understand it, but I'm sure I've had an experience that's a gateway to starting to understand it. And how about, we're doing lots of clapping and it's amazing. How about you, Kazuha, could you speak to that? Um, maybe a little bit different, but I guess, I think it, there's a lot of diversity talks in, in the programs or happening actually in Cannes right now. But I guess the thing is, you know, you see the same audience every time. 
you go to the conference, you go to this talk, but you see the same people every time. For example, I'm from Japan. You know, I don't see my people in, in any of those talks. I was there all the time, but I don't see my people. But so like, I guess it's great that we talk about this each other, with each other, but what is it that we could do to invite those people to, be, to come here and to get them mm -hmm. in the conversation? But maybe the, the only thing we could do, I mean, we want to invite them as much as possible, but the only way maybe we could be doing is to produce more content so that we could just put them in the face of them <laughs> so that they, have, they, you know, they can really help avoid, you know, they mm. can really avoid it. So I, can, I think that's happening a little bit, but again, how can we do more? Yeah. And how can, do we do, how can we do more to put that in the face and kind of as a mandatory mm -hmm. for people like, outside of the community to be part of this? I, it's something I want to do. I, like, um, at DNAD last year, I really wanted to hijack the inclusion talk, like, which was uh, my talk, <laughs> and then swap it with the, the really geeky tech talk that was going on in the next yep. room, so that the guys suddenly accidentally found themselves in an inclusion <laughs> talk. <laughs> and they wouldn't let me do it. <laughs> but that's kind of like the guerrilla tactics we need, yeah. right? We need, we, we, because you are the choir. We are definitely preaching to the choir. We've invited uh -huh. you here. We know you don't need to be told this stuff. But what we do need is for anyone in the choir to go and sing to the rest of the world when they get out of here. Yep. That's what we need you to do. Yep. Yep. The other thing for me, like to this point, I'm more glass half full as it goes, weirdly, I guess it's because it's been a strange life. But um, I s I'm doing, I'm writing a book, also out next year, which I will, it's called Loud and Proud. It's a, it's a history of queer speeches over the last 150 years, because there were no queer speeches before 150 years ago. Before. Um, and um, one of the things that you see is these cycles, these cycles of negativity, these cycles of violence, these cycles of rhetoric that come again and again and again, often against the, the community that, that preceded them. Yep. This idea of exclusionary feminism is not new. It is 100 years old, but it was first employed against lesbians mm -hmm. in Germany. This is something which we don't really talk about. So if you can understand life as a continuum where you're just a bit in it, mm -hmm. tomorrow will happen, and the future. Um, even if we burn the planet, we're still going to be here. <laughs> which we are. Yeah. This sense of continuum, you have to see what's happening around us. This can. As a, as, a, as, a, as a major step forward, the number of women on the streets, this can, is a major, major kind of like shocking to me. And I've, I'm taking great joy in the fact that whilst we may not be doing it well, we're beginning to do it. Yeah. And we are beginning to do it. And, and I will see things in 10, 20 year stages rather than in right now, has to happen right now. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, absolutely. And um, I recently shared like my life motto with someone and they found it like very empowering. So I'm, like, I'm adding that to my things I'm talking about. Um, when I was in third grade, we had a teacher who, he was actually a substitute teacher, Mr. Foray, and he would come and read the newspaper. Uh, he was like very into like current events and he would like tell us the day's date. So he would like, you know, today is September 2nd, 2006. And it's the only September 2006 there ever will be. So make the most of it. And it's like a more extended version of Carpe Diem. Um, but I think that that also really inspires me to be my most bold self and my most, you know, uncomfortable self because we are on this world, you know, on this planet for a finite amount of time. And if we are able to, you know, utilize to our best ability the blip on the radar that we are in all of human history to make the world just a smidgen better, if we're all doing that together, then we'll get free a lot quicker. People will get liberated a lot quicker. And so uh, I just wanted to share that with you all as maybe fuel to share with your, with your peers and to really spend your privilege, as Brittany Packnett says, um, because if not today, then when? Um, and so I think that's just really... I know, but it's June the 21st, 2019. It's the only June the 21st, 2019 there <laughs> ever will be. So make the most of it. Thank you. Because Look, it's, it's only a little bit of hours left. Thank you. Look, I know we, uh, we have to wrap up because people are seriously burning over that side of the terrace. Thank you but for I boiling wanna, for us. Yes, but I just wanted to end with one thing that we always do it as she says. Um, Partly, uh, you, you'll find all of these books lying around. They've got the amazing stocks of images in them. They're workbooks. I would like you to have a think about one thing you could offer someone else here 
and one thing you could ask for and have that be a framework for a conversation and perhaps some great new ideas about how to drive this forwards. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you. So that was our awesome panel discussion. Uh, you can get involved more with She Says by going to wearesheesays.com. Uh, we're in over 40 cities around the world. Uh, please continue reading Open Topics by Created by Collective. They're all fantastic. Um, and I'd love you all to think about where you go next and to make it happen and let the outside in. Bye. Bye.